Good afternoon YouTube and welcome back to the channel. A little bit different today, I'm headed up towards Clyde Bank, which is uh, the northwestern side of Glasgow, so we'll be popping through the Clyde Tunnel. Don't have to go that way, but a little bit more interesting. Anyway, the reason I'm going there, I'm specifically going to look at camping gear and tents in particular. But whilst I'm up there, there's also a little uh, sort of Roman fort. There's not much left of it, I don't think. I've never been up there actually, but um, it's part of the western end of the Antonine Wall, you know, so when the Romans settled that part of Scotland. So, whilst we're up there, we'll have a look at that as well. This is Moscow, spelt Moscow. <laughs> it bears absolutely no relation to Moscow and Russia. <laughs> not even slightly similar. Got these thicker gloves on today, it's getting really really cold so I think my other these are Revit Sand 4s just like the other ones they look very different because they are very different <laughs> but these ones are better in the sort of colder weather they're not true uh, winter gloves but they're, they're good for rain and stuff like that now folks I have a tent you know but, but it's safe to say that it's, uh, it's seen better days and it's not really suitable for motorcycle camping I quite like the look of some of the Van Gogh tents. Now, Van Gogh are a Scottish company, but that's not why I'm buying them. <laughs> I might not end up buying them, but anyway, um, I'm looking for something, you know, a long list of requirements. It's got to be lightweight. It's got to be a true sort of three season tent. And by that, I mean, you know, it will hold off in almost the worst types of weather, if you know what I mean. It doesn't need to be a, an absolute four season winter trekking thing, but it needs to be able to, you know, be comfortable enough even in weather conditions like this. It'd be nice to be able to sit up in it. <laughs> It'd be nice to have a little vestibule so I could put my gear in there and it dry off overnight, you know, the type of thing. So it needs to be sizable as well. So it's quite tricky to try and tick all those boxes without it weighing the same as a baby calf, you know, that's the problem. I'll tell you something, winter is coming in Scotland, that's for sure. I've noticed a big difference in the temperature the last week. A rainbow again. Oh well, so much for staying off the motorway, eh? Yeah? I'm guessing. Yeah. Antonine Wall. There we go. Antonine Wall and Roman Fort. Oh. What did that used to be? <laughs> so this little section here, folks, inside this fence, that's a part of the Antonine Wall itself. Now the Romans were not here for a long time, uh, but 20 years. And this is the, the northwestern frontier. People are uh, more familiar with. Um, Hadrian's Wall, obviously, but the, the Antonine Wall was an attempt by Rome to sort of push a bit further north, you know, extending those borders a bit further north. Didn't really work out, as I say, they were here for about 20 years. Now, according to this, there's a fort, fortlet, further up this hill, so let's go and have a look at the little Roman fort, see if we can find it. In front of us down here is the Clyde, on the west coast of Scotland. So the Antonine Wall would have headed all over this direction, all the way to the Firth of Forth, on the east coast. As you come up the hill here, as you come up the hill here, it's easy to see why they built it on this hill. Apparently there was about ten fortresses or little forts dotted along the Antonine Wall, and around something like um, 5,000 troops for this thing. Children's playground over there, so we're standing on what would have been the fort here. 
got it round here. We're over here. And it stretched all the way across to the Firth of Forth. You see all these little boats along the way? Yes, it did. This is not exactly what the Romans envisioned the, the float would to have turned out looking like. As you can see, all around this area, the modern world is taking over. You know, there's council estates and there's flats. <laughs> there's an SO petrol station down there. All of this buried history. But time moves on. So the Romans were here from 142 AD to about 165 AD before they abandoned the Antonine Wall. You think about how much effort, <laughs> how much time, blood, sweat and toil went into building that only to abandon it 20 years later. There's nothing really marks the fort out anymore. You can see it by drone apparently, you can see the outline. You see a lot of this with the longer grass it goes round the boat, the boundary here, that, that marks the outline of the, the fort. There was a fort and a fortlet, I guess a fortlet smaller <laughs> than a fort, and bathhouses and stuff here. So it was, it was quite, a, quite an occupation. According to the plaques up there, this is where the bathhouses were, just exactly where this old memorial is. I don't know if that's got something to do with the fact that the river was running through here. Remember, the Romans would use um, steam baths, stuff like that, to get clean. Unbelievable. Somebody's left a cone in the river. Dead shopping. So I need a tent. The problem with shopping online, especially for something like a tent, is there's far, far too many choices. About the right size. Something like this is probably a bit right. But these Eurohike ones, the, the waterproofing's not good enough, you know. <laughs> so, in terms of the weight and stuff, now about three kilograms. Three and a half kilograms, probably about right. These bigger ones are coming in six, seven kilograms, that's just crazy. It's having that combination, that balance between a decent sized tent you can set up in and keep your gear in and all that, and just the overly bulky, it's just ridiculous. Mesh or solid or blacked out. I could sit up in it at this end, I guess. It's a blackout style, smaller and lighter. Still a vestibule. So you've got to consider pack size and weight. Single skin, double skin, freestanding or peg. See, they've got a decent selection, but the ones that are about the right size, the waterproofing's not good enough. It's only maybe 2,000 millimetres of waterproofing. The ones that have got decent waterproofing are far too big. <laughs> or they're far too heavy. Of course, if it's marketed as a motorcycle specific tent, then you can expect to spend three or four times as much as you would for the same tent with a different brand name. See, this is great and all that, but is it overkill? Is it just too big? <laughs> you know, this is probably seven kilograms, maybe. It's great. Wonderful. This is a van so it's a really good mate. I can sit in here. Obviously, there's loads of space, but. There's enough space in there alone without having all this extra. What do you think? Should we carry this on the Himalayan? <laughs> these tents these days are ridiculous. This is somebody's house. That's, I mean, really? So, folks, this is a genuine appeal. I need a tent that's reasonable value, that's going to stand up to decent weather, that I can sit up in and it's got plenty of space for me and all my additional gear. I need to dry it off. For example, panniers and stuff like that, yeah? Help! Help! 
<laughs> there must be some motorcycle camping experts out there with a decent tent for a long time that's worked for them in different conditions. So I would appreciate if you comment below and let me know. Alright folks, that's it for this one. I really hope you liked this. If you did, give me a thumbs up, subscribe down below. Don't forget to hit that like button. Leave a comment, tell me what tent I should buy.